this is a hands-on learning environment. Unfortunately, that is life. We don't get to sort of test drive our interpersonal relationships. We have to just go out there and make mistakes on each other. And there are casualties in the process. Yes. Hold on to your hats because it's the Nora McInerney and Sean Galanos show. Uh, Nora is fantastic. She's an author of No Happy Endings, of the Hot Young Widows Club, host of the Terrible Thanks for Asking podcast, co-founder or maybe founder of Still Kicking. Nora and I go deep on this idea that love is hard and relationships are hard and they take work and that we pretty much are just like learning it as we go because we didn't get any relationship education. So this is a warm, sweet, funny conversation on what it means to grow up not really knowing how to do love right and learning as we go and making a ton of mistakes along the way. And how all of that is just pretty much normal. That's just how it is. I'm super pumped to share this episode with you. This is a fantastic conversation and I am so grateful to Nora. My name is Sean Galanos and this is The Love Drive. Okay, let's let's go because we can do this all. Oh, is that and, not the podcast? Is that not the topic? Oh no, this isn't the. T- but this is this is where it starts right, right, right. here. Nora, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, my name is Nora McNerney. I am a writer. I am a podcaster. I am a a, a social entrepreneur. Which is such a strange thing to say, which really just means I've I've started a business. And I spend my work life and I think a lot of my personal life at in the in the hard spaces in life, kind of at that intersection of of life and and uh, and the parts of it that we try our best to avoid that are absolutely unavoidable. (sighs) So great to have you here. I'm super, super excited. Oh, my God. Same. I just I even love just hearing your voice. I'm just smiling like a dope. For people who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about where, like, where does your story with grief start? Like, how how did you get here? Just brief, briefly. Briefly. Oh, wow. Keyword briefly. If you would have asked me any other day, I would have said, 2014, that's when my husband died. My dad died. I lost a pregnancy. Boop, boop, boop. There, I'm in grief. But I was talking, again, with a friend yesterday, and I realized 2021 means that it has been 11, not 11 years. It has been 10 years. It's been 10 years since that husband of mine who died was my boyfriend who was diagnosed um, with brain cancer. And I would have not at the time identified with with grief or grieving. I would have said, no, 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 that's for dead people. How dare you? Mm. But of course I was. And I, I think that resistance to that word and to that label caused a lot of a lot of pain in my life. So I would say uh, that's that's my on ramp into this version of my life is like most people being catapulted into a version that they did not choose. I feel like grief isn't something that we like ease into. Very rarely do we, even when it's you know I'd I'd thought of it as, oh, well, it starts when the person dies, right? And so I had a, I had a long on-ramp with Aaron, um, if you consider three years long, which I don't, but it's, it's longer than my friend Mo, whose husband disappeared one day and never came back. But I was catapulted into it. It was unexpected. We were young and we were just, we'd been together for a year, just that magical moment of finally, and I say finally, I was 27 when I met him, like get a grip. 
I was 27 and I was like, oh my God, it's finally happening. I finally found somebody where like, like love is not like this, you know, sort of, uh, begging a person, right? Or it's not, you know, trying to convince the wrong person that I'm the right person. It's, it's just so easy. We just like each other. We love each other. We want good things for each other. What is happening? And then he got sick and all of those, those experiences that we had together through his sickness, those were moments of grief, even as we were experiencing moments of of such joy, of of getting married, of having a baby, of you know moving into uh, uh, a house that was going to be accessible for his future, and all of it was, all of it was, and they were they were different moments of grief that happened just as suddenly. It it happens suddenly when somebody has a seizure next to you. Um, mm. It happens suddenly when uh, oh, uh, your your brain tumor's back. All of these things, it, it sometimes feels like we're the lobster that's been in the water for a long time. But you do get pulled out momentarily and then dropped back in. You said you said earlier that like for the for the first five years you were sort of grieving, and then uh, these last five years you've been sort of immersed in other people's grief. Yeah, I think the first five years that I would not have identified as grief were Aaron. The first four years would have been Aaron being sick, and after Aaron died, I thought, okay, let's just do this as quickly as possible. Grief is gross. Oh, grief. Let's just get it done. Let's just, but, and, and honestly, let's not even do it. Let's just like focus on the bright side. Like I fell in love with a great person. So let's focus on that. Let's put on some lipstick, run a half marathon, take a bunch of cute selfies and, and the year will happen. And obviously after a year it expires, you're a genius. You've worked around it. And I, before Aaron died, he and I both worked in advertising. We worked, I was, I was working in-house at a, at a corporation. He was at an agency. I had worked in agencies before. I say that because now that I do have, you know, a, a, a pretty big public radio podcast and I'm a published author, I, that was not my trajectory. That was not my life. It wasn't my goal at all. Um, but Aaron dying, it's such a strange story. How I got here that I think is worth reminding people, which is that Aaron and I, when he was sick, we wrote his obituary together. Yeah, I remember reading that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. It's honestly, it's the most read. It's it's the most successful piece of writing I've ever um, created. <laughs> And and it's I have a I have a co byline. It's not even my, all my own words. He's so funny. And we wrote this obituary together. And if you are listening and you want to Google it, just Google Aaron, A A R O N Permort P U R M O R T obituary. You'll see it. So that obituary went viral. I I got attention for the other writing that I had done, and that led to uh, an agent, and that led to you know writing those book proposals and getting those book deals, and that led to a lot of things, but really the impetus behind all of it is that that obituary went viral and I started to get so many messages, Sean, like messages in email and Facebook and, and Twitter and anywhere that somebody could contact me, they were contacting me and they were sending me their own story. Mm. And I realized really, really quickly that I wasn't that special, that the thing that I was just uh, so sure was, you know, my defining feature, you know, that, that, oh, I had experienced these, these losses and can anyone believe it? Yeah. A lot of people can believe it because a lot of people have been there <laughs> and a lot of people are there right now. And one of those people is um, my friend Casey, who I, I, don't even know how we found each other, but his wife died the same day that Aaron did. And we did not know each other. He lived on the other side of the country. And that night, that first night of widowhood, when I was staring in the mirror, I was thinking someone else is feeling this. Mm. And it was Casey. It was Casey who was going through just the most sudden, dramatic experience out of nowhere, who also had a kid 
who is the same age as the child I had with Aaron. And I had so many messages like that. And I didn't know what to do with them other than reply to them. And that was really what drove me to to write, to write a book. That's what drove me to pitch a podcast. I had zero, zero experience in audio. It was 2015 where it wasn't, I, maybe it was easy to make your own podcast. I certainly didn't even cross my mind that I could do it on my own. I thought, well, I got to find, you know, I got to get into public radio. There's nowhere else to do it. You have to call Ira Glass. I got to call Ira Glass. I got to call somebody. It's the only way. It's the only way. And uh, and and that's kind of where it all uh, came from, which is not that I had this big sort of uh, ambition or big strategy, but just what do I do now with what I have? Mm. And that's sort of what got me here on the floor of my closet, sitting cross-legged talking to you. <laughs> well, life happened. It just happens. Life. Yeah. <laughs> Some people ask me like, oh, why do I do what I do? And literally the answer is like, oh, it's the best thing that I have going for me right now. Yeah. Like yeah. It, this is just like it just over time, this thing has developed and this is what I do now. Yes. Yes. And I think that that comes through. I think you can tell in somebody's work when they have sort of manufactured a a, a personality or a niche for themselves mm. and and when it's just it's the best thing for them to be doing. Mm. You know, it's like I, I imagine when you're start, it's not like you were like, now, look, I really enjoy baseball and uh, relationships. Uh, also, I have a passing interest in um, comic books. So huh, I guess I'll pick this one. <laughs> I don't it's not as if there were, you know, uh, I, I wasn't sitting around thinking, OK, well, you know, I, I have this this huge grief that I'm I'm dragging around trying to find my way, trying to untangle it, trying to even define it, trying to figure out who I am in this world. But I also what if I just made a recap show of of Real Housewives, which if my life had been different, that probably would have been the podcast that I started. Mm. <laughs> like I probably would have started if Aaron were still alive, we would have a dumb, amazing, funny podcast together. <laughs> That's what we would be doing. That's what we would be doing. Instead, you're you're sharing what grieving looks like to a lot of people who don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And I think also just that label, like what is grief? It is still so small for so many of us. It's still like, well, I mean, it's, you know, well, no one died. And, you know, if I could rewrite the the promo materials for grief, I would say like grief more than just death. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's really, for me, there's so much grief in the work I do. And there's so much of reminding myself and uh, while I remind myself reminding other people that this is just hard like and, and it's not hard because there's something wrong with you it's hard because that's what hard things are <laughs> it's it's not as if you you're somehow ineffective or you know defective that you're struggling through a loss or that you're struggling through um, you know, relationships that you're struggling through your career. It's just that sometimes things are just hard and that's okay. I feel like often times things are hard. Yeah. Life is hard. Yes. It's yeah. hard and it's, it's awkward. So awkward. So awkward. <laughs> so awkward. Relationships are awkward. Like meeting new people is awkward saying goodbye, not getting what you want. Like, uh, a lot of it is hard. It's so, not getting what you want. Uh, and then also it not being somehow a reflection on who you are or what you deserve or, you know, just sort of driving you into that space where you now hate yourself because you did not get the result that you were expecting. And that result was based on incomplete or completely inaccurate information. And uh, having a healthy relationship for the first time in my life and then losing it for me, 
I have so much, so much gratitude for that experience, for all of it. I would love for Aaron to be alive. I'm not a monster. And also, I wouldn't trade, like, if if I could go back in time and 27-year-old Nora at the time was, you know, like, she had a couple options. She had a couple options. One of those guys is still alive today. And if I could, if I could go back in time on those first dates and be like, look, one of these guys is going to die, I would have in that moment been like, oops, not going to do that. No, 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 no. No, I'm going to I'm going to choose the guy who's going to live. And knowing what I know now, I would never I would not I would not make a different choice for anything. Mm. No way. This is how I choose to live life. Mm -hmm. Every experience has led to to me being the person that I am today. Yes. And for you being the person that you are today, and if you're listening at home, like all of the shitty things that have happened have led to you being this fantastic person. And I'm not not being like, uh, what's the word? You know, where you like give compliments for no reason? Oh, yeah. I don't know. My vocabulary is taking a real nosedive. (laughs) Like, I'm not trying to be that. Like, I, I do think that for the most part, people are fantastic. And all the shitty things that have happened, including like hard childhood and drug abuse and, you know, anything really has, has shaped us to be who we are. We'd be different if, if, if Aaron hadn't died, we wouldn't be talking. I know. I know so many things like would not happen and understanding that like all these things are make me who I am. That's so nice now that I like myself. <laughs> and that people like you also. I, I mean, it's not everyone. But for not the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Do mean, you have a lot of haters? Yeah. Oh. I mean, you know, I try not to give it too much energy anymore, but of course it's like to do anything in the world to, and this is me, I would just whisper into my ear as a child, if I could, and in in my twenties, if I could like to do anything in the world, like you think everyone's going to like you. And my hope was like, yes, obviously. And then you have to ask yourself, do you like everyone? Do you like everything? And it's like, well, no, but shouldn't I be the exception? <laughs> but yeah. like in my 20s, I knowing that everything was making me who I was, well, I didn't like myself and that would not have been helpful. But I would have said it is making you into someone that you will like. Mm. Okay, that's I think really important because you're right. If you don't like yourself, then you can feel really shitty about all the stuff that has happened to make you the person that you don't like if you don't know that you'll eventually turn into somebody that you do like. And, and I, I think when you look at old photos of yourself, or if you look at an old photo of the person that you love now, or a person that you have loved, it's like, I found this picture, this I'm, I'm remarried. I'm, I'm married to a man named Matthew. And he seems great, by the way. He's so great. He's so great. He's on the other side of this closet wall, hanging out with our four-year-old. He just <laughs> And he's he just, a great dad. He's such a good dad. He just cleaned the vacuum. And you know whose vacuum that is? That's my dead husband's vacuum. He knows I'm so attached to that vacuum. That vacuum is 12 years old. Who knows? Who knows if it's still really doing anything? Every time he uses it, he cleans it out. He checks it out. He's like, don't worry. I clean. It's so sweet. And... um. And the, but the toaster, he wasn't able to the fix toaster, the second time. He tried to fix the toaster so many times. We still have it just in case my dead husband's toaster. And <laughs> it's, it's grief is so weird. But I found this Polaroid of Matthew and it's like Matthew's 20 years old. He's sitting on the floor of some who knows where. It's like he's so cute and nothing has like happened to him yet. He hasn't had his heart broken. He... He hasn't like gotten married and divorced and gone through all these difficult things. And I was just like, oh, God, buddy, like you have to do so much to get here. Mm. Like so much has to happen to get you here cleaning out my vacuum. (laughs) And, And I think about that for myself, too. And when when my friends or when people I love are people who 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 reach out to me are really sort of like in that space where they're like, but I want, like, I want love, like, I want a relationship, or this person ended a relationship, and it hurt me. I, I think you are in it now. 
like you're in it now. And that is perspective. Where you are is perspective, but it's not like the full picture. I don't know how to explain it. It's just like I've just been thinking about that nonstop in anticipation for this conversation, which is like, I don't know, like even now, like, is this the full perspective? No. And someday I'll be looking at photos of myself at age 38 and think like, oh, you got to go through a lot to get to where here. Yeah. The new the new here. Right. Like even now I'm on my way somewhere. Who knows where? Who knows where we're going? And life being the way it is, like, will continue to be hard. It will. And and wonderful. And also with with so with absolutely nothing in my control. (laughs) So, I mean, your your action and your reaction to other people. Yes. But like there is so little that we have control over. So little. And I, I've, I've always wanted to, um, like so many people. And I think this is the, the parts of your work that resonate so much with me are like, well, I just want to be liked. Like, I just want to be loved, but at what cost? Because Mm -hmm. at no point previously did I ever consider my own my own taste or my own preferences or like, well, what do I want beyond being liked? And does it matter who likes me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should. Like, (laughs) you know, it should. And I think professionally and interpersonally and in romantic relationships, it should matter, not just that you are liked, but who likes you. Mm. You you said something about that recently online. I was like, oh, wow. Oof. Oh, like imagine, imagine a world where, and I lived in this world, by the way, every person who like asked me out, I was like, well, I guess I'm your girlfriend. Like, I, I don't have to, I don't have to imagine that world too hard because I occupied it and it was miserable. (laughs) It was miserable. It really, really made me into nothing, into nobody, into just a person with no identity, no defining characteristics other than, well, I have a boyfriend. Like, who is he? Oh, I mean, you know. <laughs> he, he calls now and then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's 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 he sometimes likes me. I've 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 decided to twist the kaleidoscope in in a way where it sort of resembles something like a relationship. And I oh God, it just hurts to to remember that and to think about all the energy that was expended on that instead of expended on myself honestly Mm -hmm. like on the the absolute most important relationship and longest lasting relationship you have which is with yourself and i have a teenager a a 14 year old like what does every 14 year old want like a hand to hold you know (laughs) like um somebody to make tiktoks with like our our desires when we're teenagers really are not that different from our desires as adults like we want to be loved like we do and it's it's watching that sort of unfold in a young person that you love you just want to say like i need you to love yourself as much as i love you Nora, I'm like, I'm over here crying. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just so much. It's like, I'm, o- I'm over here crying because like, I tried so hard to have people love me. Mm. I wanted so much for relationships to work out. I spent so much time and energy with people who just weren't really good to me. Mm-hmm. Like not good for me, like n- not good to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Like mean mm. and uh, like unthoughtful and and I still wanted it like I still wanted it so much and at some point maybe it's like years of therapy or getting sober or I'm not sure exactly what some perfect combination at some point I realized that I would much rather be alone than be with somebody who doesn't treat me well even somebody who doesn't like kind of treat me well you know, like I want someone to treat me like really, really well most of the time, right? Because like people are human and they fuck up all the time. And you have a quote here that says like, um, like marry somebody with a lot of patience. Yes. Right? Because like- <laughs> yeah, highly recommend. Yeah, life is hard and like we fuck up. But 
at, at some point I realized I would rather be alone than be with people who even just a little bit mistreat me. Mm. Right. And, and that speaks to this relationship that you talk about the most important relationship being the one that you have with yourself, which is like, it's the longest relationship you're going to have. Yeah. yeah. Forever. 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 And would you rather have 50 years with a person who depletes you mm. or a person who, you know, where there's glimmers of, of, of happiness and, and joy and respect or have 50 years with yourself and treat yourself the exact way you deserve to be treated. And now I can say the second one. But in my 20s, it was, it was, it was, the, it was, I would rather have, you know, three dates with somebody who doesn't return any of my texts, even after we have been naked together. Um, I would like the things that I put myself through and the ways that I just immediately compromised what I wanted to be somewhat more appealing to other people. And then in response, the cowardly way I treated people that I was not interested in a relationship with <laughs> the way like I broke up with Kyle. If you are out there, I owe you the biggest. I broke up with a, you on a bicycle. I just said we should not date anymore. And I peeled off onto a different path. Literally. What a crappy person. Like what a crappy person. What better than ghosting. Slightly better than ghosting. <laughs> Way cooler though. Oh, Way cooler. Better visual and <laughs> nice optics. Yeah, nice optics. I was like, yes, I'm, and I mean this literally and figuratively. Uh, I, I just, I, I was so incapable of advocating for myself and my needs. Nor did I even know what I needed or wanted that I that that I couldn't even express them to another person. When I was the person, you know, letting them down, you had this post that was like, how to tell somebody you don't want to date. Hey, I didn't really, you know, feel like the spark, but I wish you the best. I had, you know, I had fun, but just not really there. How easy, what an easy message to send. Would I have done it? No, 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 no. God, no, no. I need to be clear that like that message, it took me a really, really long time to be able to to actually send that to someone. Yeah. Right? Like, I fucked up a lot. I mean, there, oh. there's a reason why I do what I do now. I was not good. Like, in my 20s, even up into my early 30s, like, I fucked up a lot, you yeah. know? Like, I, I didn't really know how to be honest. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I'm hoping now that I can help some people be a little bit more honest and I can help people kind of move through this stuff with a little bit more ease and a little bit more class because I think I really got it wrong a lot of the time. Yeah. I don't know what kind of book you're thinking about, but I do think that you should do something that is for adolescents and parents because our kids only learn from watching like a marriage or not even a marriage like most uh, there is no average american family anymore which i love and so you don't know what you're not teaching your kids until you know they're going through their first breakup and you pick up their phone and you're like i'm sorry you said what to a person <laughs> like <laughs> i'm sorry what where why um and uh, it's it's so difficult, and you just realize, oh, I I expected somebody to learn this stuff like through osmosis. What? Like, and who was teaching me? Where did I even learn this stuff? I just think every time I see something like that, I want to send it to every young person that I know. Um, <laughs> and so I don't know, just some unsolicited advice. But I do think that there's like a there's a like a podcast mini series in there or there's just something for um for 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 parents to help their kids learn this stuff because when you've been in a relationship for a long time you forget like you forget <laughs> I I have a really hard time with unsolicited advice, but uh, unsolicited yeah. <laughs> advice coming from Nora McInerney, I will gladly take it about writing books. 
You, yeah, it's you got just, it. It's just, it's not even, I just like, it's a, it's a request, maybe. It's a request, um, because it's, it's just such a, it's such a lonely time. I don't know where kids learn it from. I, I, where we learn it from media, right? Like we learn it from, I guess, our friends. And well, we're the same age. Yeah. Right? So where, the, where did yeah. we learn it? Where did, where did we learn did it we, from? Where did we, I, I didn't, I didn't do it well. No. So, like I didn't really learn it. I think I learned it through like a lot of bad experiences thinking, oh, there must be a better way to right. treat somebody. Oh, and yeah. also like, ouch, that really hurt like the way they dealt with that. Mm-hmm. There must be a better way for me to be treated and right. to eventually over time figure out like what makes sense for me? What do I want? What are my needs? Like I, I never picked up like a manual. No. On how to be good in relationship or good at life. Like there's no syllabus, like you say. Yeah. There's no guidebook to this stuff. Yeah. And there's a lot of really bad advice. So much bad advice. It's it's all of the books. God, what books did I read in my twenties? Um, I think I read The Rule. Uh Oh, I've read the rules. Oh my gosh. And I also read the game, Sean. I read, I read the, the game. The game. <laughs> okay. I read the game. <laughs> It made me intolerable. Okay, like, I tr- I I read the game in Panama. I lived in Panama for a little while. I I tried the the, the strategies in the game. I was miserable, 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 and miserable. I made other people miserable. And I was so desperate, so desperate. And I could tell which men had read it, and then <laughs> because my friends and I were also like emotionally immature, we were like we would do it then to boys. <laughs> like we were like oh. Well, you know, this guy, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And, and our, our whole like thing was like, oh, we just don't care. But we, we just do don't care. care. We but we care, care so much. So much. <laughs> uh, the, the whole like don't care, you know, look cool um, because then you'll have the power. Yes. Oh, the power. Who wants the power? Nobody wants the power. You don't want power. I don't want power. I want... <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I don't want relationship comfort. power. I don't want relationship power at all. And you know, you know, when you have it too, which is such a, and you, when you are in a healthy place and you realize like that somebody is, this happened recently where there's like this disagreement where I could tell that it felt like I could tell Matthew felt like I then had like a chip and I was like, no, 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 I'm not taking a chip. No, like there's no score. Like we are just. We are going to resolve this very small thing that in previous versions of our relationships, we would have both allowed to become a big thing Mm -hmm. in another relationship and a thing that could be brought up maybe in the future uh, as, as 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 a currency. And we're not doing that. I don't want that. It's so unappealing to me. Everything is like an isolated incident. Right. I mean, we yeah, deal with this one. This one's in a vacuum that Matthew just cleaned. Yes. <laughs> it's in we're, the freshly cleaned vacuum. We're going to deal with it and then we're going to move out of it and, and that stays there. Yes. Which Instead is, of I, becoming like currency. Currency and just a constant scoreboard going in my brain or in my journal. Just constantly just waiting to bring something up. I just, I feel so much like there are apologies that I was probably owed in past relationships and also apologies that I owe people for my past relationships. And I think one of the most healing things to think about is, uh, I guess, you know, not only that all of those things like made you who you are today and, and got you somewhere, but that like, we were all learning, like all of us, like we all learned, like we learn on each other, which is such a strange thing. And oh I was God. someone's lesson. We learn on each other. Like, you know, it's all, it's all applied. It's all applied, you know, what what god what are they doing in school it's like yeah this is a hands-on learning environment unfortunately that is life unfortunately like we don't get to sort of test drive our interpersonal relationships we have to just go out there and make mistakes on each other and there are casualties in the process yes yes and also just the idea that 
not every relationship that is a failure because it didn't work out. Well, I think that no relationship is a failure. It just ended. It just ended. It's a, it's a failure if you didn't learn anything from it. Right. And it's just so strange because I used to think like, well, if we're not together anymore, I hate you. <laughs> Like, and I wasted my time. And I wasted my time. I've and wasted you are three years of my life. Three years of my life. Three years of my life. And I do think that I would still block people. Like, I still think it's, I think it's still healthy to, you know, not leave all these sort of like peepholes open into other people's lives. I think if, if we are not dating, I, I, I think it is a very hard thing to sort of take a step back in intimacy. I did learn that in Catholic school, so I don't know if that's productive, but it's like, you know, once we've already, you know, d- there, once we've crossed a certain level, I don't think, you know, I need to know how you're spending your weekends. Um, if you, they're not you also lose anymore. the right. You lose, you lose the, right. the right. You, you lose, lose the, the right, right to have access to my life if yeah. we break up. Yeah, but also, and also I can look back and be like, hey, like, it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. It wasn't for me. But he's not a terrible person. He just was not right for me. Just like to somebody, Matthew was not the thing, which is so bananas to me. I'm like, thank God people didn't like him, yeah. you know, <laughs> like and thank God he's too like, you know, sort of he's too thick to like understand when a person does like him. Like I had to be like, I like you. And he was like, oh, oh, good. <laughs> great. Um, Because he could have clued in on someone else. He could have clued in on someone else. Like, think about that. And thank God, like, for every person who rejected me, because I got Aaron. Yeah. And I got Matthew. Yeah. But when you're in the throes of it. It just feels like it's not It's not going to happen. The, end, the, the, the world is ending. You will be alone for the rest of your life. Forever. You will be the Incredible Hulk wandering the earth alone. There's only, that's the only option. That's the only option. <laughs> This is kind of a non sequitur, but not really. You're probably used to interviewing people and then have them cry, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So I, I've I've been moved now twice to yeah. tears. Do you have it often where the host is crying all the time? Oh, oh yeah, okay. that's what oh. I, I do. It all. I I cry in in many interviews. I would say <laughs> I I edit it out, but like, because I'm not. You're a you're a subtle subtle crier which i, I am uh, an elegant weeper i'm being me. moved i'm being you're an ugly crier i i just like i'm a very it's very audible for me uh it's very just like uh very phlegmy it's disgusting i i'm yeah i am i'm maybe i'm more like classy you are you are I, like an yeah it's like there's probably like one loose tear that it, 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 no, they, it's the the tear it actually didn't tear but they did well they're both, welling okay. both sides welled and um what what came up for me which is by the way if you're listening uh great language when someone is crying or tearing up you can say um what's coming up for you oh instead of saying what's like wrong? why what's wrong or why are you crying yeah <laughs> yeah what's wrong because sometimes it's not it's nothing's wrong and so like what what came up for me was this collective sadness for um how young people this is this is and this is a projection or maybe just a perception how young people are struggling these days with the relationship based on what i'm seeing on tiktok yes oh my God, um, hold on. I have to ch- plug in my computer one second. Do one it. One second. One second. Listeners, stay with us. We're, we, we're in a closet. We've got a very precarious situation. I'll keep talking about TikTok. We've got, TikTok is, oh my God. I, it's, it's really a place of great joy and great disturbance for me. Um, Your closet has power? Uh, our closet has power. It's really like a storage space for our whole house. Um, we have a very small house. I was like, whatever. We don't need a lot of space pandemic. Uh, so we're, we're like right on top of each other. So in this closet, I used to have an office, like I used to have like a little desk area, but Matthew's great passion in life is drumming. It's like his very favorite creative outlet. There's no space for drums. So I cleared out so he could have a drum set. The drum set fits in the closet? It's, uh, I got a, a walk electric in. drum small set. drum set. It's very small. Closet. Yeah. His giant drum set. I don't know what we're going to, it's, it's in climate controlled storage now because it's vintage and he loves it. And I do, I love, I love seeing him play drums and I have, we have to find a spot for it. We will need like several kids to leave the house first. These are the compromises, 
right? Those like, are the compromises. So, someone's yeah. like, yeah, I really like my new boyfriend, but he plays the drums and that sounds loud. You know, like, can I, can I deal with that? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah. You can. He, you can totally deal with the fact that your boyfriend plays the drums. Yes. Oh, my God. It's like the hottest thing in the world. Plus, you get you get electric drums that he just plugs them in and he has a headset and he can play his favorite music and drum along with it. So he's like playing with the National every night. He's happy. He's so happy. It's so nice to have somebody have something that they love. And that makes that makes you happy. It makes me so happy. I, I seriously, I watch him like from the the doorway. I just watched him play drums because he can't see me, and he'll just he just does it for hours. It's so sweet. And you don't feel threatened by the drums. God no. I. It's also like being in your in my twenties. If a boy had an interest outside of me, I was like, what? <laughs> how how could you? First off, why? Uh, what does basketball give you that I don't? Um, right. So much, by the so way. So much, so much. And <laughs> exercise. Like, exercise. Endorphins. Also, I'm like, Nora, why didn't you work on finding something that you liked instead of building your entire personality off the person you were with? And those were the kinds of questions I was not ready to ask myself. <laughs> Okay, so oh. this is that's connected to the the TikTok madness. Yes, uh, yes. A lot of anxiety. Yes. A lot of anxiety, a lot of control, mm-hmm. a lot of insecurity, a lot of fear. And mm-hmm. I I get it. I get it also because I think I was like that too when I was younger. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I I I made a post yesterday or last week about how to ask your partner for like space for like a weekend alone. Yes, yeah. And the comments were like, frankly, a little disturbing, oh, because a lot of people said, comments. "Don't read the comments." Oh, Is it, <laughs> don't my, read. Yeah, never, I, never I read try not com- to. Yeah, never read the yeah. comments. Don't do it. I but I can't not read the comments. And a lot of people were like, "Oh, if my partner asked me for for a weekend's worth of space, I would assume that they were cheating on me, or that they wanted to break up with me, and they didn't know how to do it, and I just wouldn't trust them." <laughs> and basically, all I said was like, "You know, hey, honey." Um, I love spending time with you, but this weekend I'd love to spend alone. And I also don't really want to be texting. Mm. So if you're up for it, let's just catch up on Monday. Mm. Yeah. And to me, that that seems like pretty normal because because I can do that in my relationship. And I didn't really like read the room and I didn't really assume that like a lot of people's relationships aren't that healthy. And in an unhealthy yeah. relationship, that's not going to work. No. Also, don't you ever want time alone? <laughs> don't you ever just want to sit with your own self and your own thoughts and read a book and, uh, and watch TV that somebody else doesn't enjoy? I do. All the time. All the time. Uh, All the time. Especially if you have kids. Oh, my God. Even more. Yeah. You got to lock and yourself in the bathroom. I got to lock myself in this closet and, <laughs> and, and talk to also, Sean for as long as possible. Talk to Sean for as long as possible. And also that's a, for any parents, that is also a thing to like express and model for your kids Yeah, is, and, and also have them advocate for what they need. The other day we have a seven-year-old, we have four-year-old, four-year-old's obsessed with the seven-year-old, seven-year-old's obsessed with the 19-year-old, 19-year-old, if you can believe it, does not want to spend all his time with a seven-year-old doesn't want to and hard seven to year old, if you can believe it until he realized like wait i think girls really like to see me with little kids I'm absolutely like, mm-hmm, absolutely they do yes yes that is true that is true um seven-year-old is like trying to explain to the four-year-old i need some time alone you know i need alone time just like my big brother, our big brother also needs alone time right now. And four-year-old is just crushed over it. And I'm like, buddy, don't you sometimes need time alone? He's like, well, yes, but but I don't want anyone to need time alone from me. Yeah. Like he personalized it in this yeah. way that I'm like, yes, of course, that's how it feels. It feels like it's about you. It's not about you, bud. It's not about you. And our kids, I feel like one thing I did learn from my parents that I'm very grateful for and somehow only sunk in much later in life. My parents had different houses when I was in my 20s. Married for almost 40 years. My dad's dead now. Loved the crap out of each other. My dad, like me, could not handle a Minnesota winter. Would fall into these big, thick depressions. Got a house, got a space in um, Southern California out in the desert and spent his winters there. And my mom would go visit him. 
And they always took separate vacations too. My dad would go, my dad liked golfing. He did not want to go and, 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 uh, he didn't want to sit on an airplane and fly over the ocean. No, he did that once in Vietnam, not doing it again. My mom wanted to like, you know, go on these. uh, She went on trips with her girlfriends. He went on trips with like his friends. Occasionally they would take a trip with like a selection of children. Like it was just very normal for me to see my parents have their own interests and uh, and in healthy relationships, I've really loved and encouraged that. And in unhealthy relationships, when I was unhealthy, by the way, I don't think it was all my boyfriends. I think it was me. I was like, oh, what does that mean? What does it mean that you want to go to a show with just your friends? It means that you want to go to a show with just your friends, That's not it. me. That's all. Well, and I, not you. Yes. Someone, I, someone said one of the comments was, Okay, what if she asks for alone time, but then wants to hang out with her friends? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Yes. She yes. she wants space. Yes, from you also. Yes, from you also. How normal. Like, I think there's there are very few couples. I know that Paul and Linda McCartney never spent a night away from each other. And that's so cute. And so abnormal. I mean, so unusual. You know? Unusual. Like, very unusual. Very unusual. That Sounds like it was unlikely. Seems unlikely, but uh, but they that's that's the legend of them, right? They met and they never spent a night alone. And that's their legend. That's their legend. <laughs> that's their legend. I don't know even where I heard this from. It honestly probably was like Tumblr in two thousand six. What has Paul <laughs> McCartney even done? He spent every night with Linda. With Linda, okay. That's his claim to fame. That is his claim to fame. Who's who's Paul McCartney? Notorious husband. Okay. <laughs> clingy, clingy Fam- husband. <laughs> Famous husband. Famous husband. Oh God. And uh and I think being able to do those things, um, it does take trust, it takes communication, and also it takes I don't know, like really just caring and respecting who your person is. Yeah. I, when I travel, by the way, or if someone else travels, this is how I grew up, Sean. Like, I just trust your plane got there, frankly. You yeah. know, like, I feel like if it didn't, I would hear about it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, pretty quickly. Plane, <laughs> right? <laughs> plane, plane to Costa Rica crashes right. in Guatemala. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I just, when someone travels, I'm just like, okay, well, see you when you get back. Matthew, like, he really values a check in. He really values like, you know, just just to him, he he feels loved when I express that I am thinking about him. Like when I get on a plane, I say I'm on the plane when my plane lands and I say, like, I'm here and here's my plan for the next few days. He doesn't need to hear from me every day, but he does want to know like what the he he doesn't love a disappearance. He doesn't love a disappearance. No. And. No one likes to, to be ghosted, even if it's just for a weekend. Even if even if you're married. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting to me when he like first brought that up to me. Because I was like, I really wouldn't care at all. Um, like, you you I, say bye. You kiss me on the right. cheek. You leave. I assume the, you you're leave, good. You're coming back. Yeah. I assume you're coming back. And also, we had very, very different relationship experiences. Very different. Our relationships before we met each other, the opposite the opposite. And so knowing that is I could take that in several ways. I could be like, wow, you're really insecure. Wow. You're really, I take it as he is finally realizing what he needs and asking for it. And I have this opportunity to love him in the way that he wants to be loved. Mm. And so I, do I always remember to do it? No, I'm the worst. But when I do, I'm like, yes, I did the thing that like, will make him, you know, feel good and remind him that I do love him. It feels so good to give people the thing that they need when they've expressed it to you clearly and and nicely, you know, and not made you guess, not make you come home and be like, wait, something happened, but I don't know what, (laughs) you know, I have to guess that he's mad because I didn't send him the airplane landing emoji and the airplane takeoff emoji at dollars. Right. And I would have, I would have in my unhealthiest phases been like, yeah, guess you should know. If you know me, you, you should to- know. <laughs> you need to know how to love me. You need to know how to love me. And honestly, what is, what has really reminded me that we are all learning on each other is that I grew up in the same household as all four of my siblings. 
I, I, I can't remember if I told this story in like an email or something, but so if you've already heard it, too bad. But it's my husband's death anniversary is always on the same day. It's always November 25th. He will always have died on November 25th. And this year on November 25th, I get, you know, like I turn off my phone most of the day. Like, you know, I get I get like a couple cards. I get like one of my friends sends me flowers. I turn on my phone. There's not a single message from my siblings or my mother. Mm. And I was like, um, okay. My unhealthy self would be like, wow, you don't love me. Here's the proof. And I realized, okay, I'm going to, I have to say this to them, right? Like I have to tell them what I needed. I have to, to get what I need. I have to first express that I need it. And I fire up the group chat and I tell them it's Aaron's death anniversary. I know you love me. I know you love me. And when I don't hear from you on this day, it makes me feel like, no one but me remembers. Mm. It makes me feel, it makes me feel like you don't love me. And I got, and, and I expressed not just what I need, but also what they can do is like, go in your calendars right now, put it in there mm. <laughs> next year on the 25th. I want a call or a text. I want something like before noon. That's it. <laughs> right. Before noon. Before uh, noon. I, it, like, <laughs> it's, it's reasonable. I mean, get, it's reasonable. Get, your, get your coffee, check your calendar, send a message. Check your calendar, send a message. And my sister called me and she was like, oh, my God, you know what? I thought of Aaron. I thought of you. She's like, I just didn't call. I'm sorry. I'm like, thank you. My brothers called. They were like, I this is so different for me. I would never want anyone to reach out to me. <laughs> Yeah. Like, they're like, I would rather just not have someone remind me. I was like, okay, like, I'll remember that, you know, on dad's death anniversary. And they're like, but I'll do this for you next year. Like, I stopped myself from telling myself one story and just asked for what I needed. And it's like, if, if the people who grew up with us, who have known us the longest, don't always know what to do with and for us, how can we expect someone who's known us for a fraction of that time to just know the steps to a dance we have never told them what they were even doing? That's the book, by the way, the the, the book that I want to write. There you go. How there to you ask go. for anything. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, yes, yes. Do Identif that. Identifying your needs and then making Ugh. requests that work from people. Yes. Because no one knows what you need. No one knows. Like, no one knows. And you truly think, like... Yeah, they do. They're just choosing to not do it. That's a good story. Right? It's like, no, they're not. <laughs> like, they're absolutely not. They were just, it was just a Thursday for them. Like, it was just a, or whatever day it was. It was just a Tuesday. Like, they were just Tuesday. living their lives, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and I, I truly, like, I could have blown that up into something that would have really harmed our relationship. Like, I could have, and probably other years would have. A lot of relationships, not not just one. Right, a Your lot. Your whole family. Could... My whole family. Also, like, that date happened, you know, happened, but it also mm -hmm. happened specifically to you. I know. Right? Like, it, mm -hmm. it's more important to you than it is to other mm -hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we expect people to know. Yeah. And it's like, they just don't. Like, they just don't. Oh, God, what a, what a, what an absolute. And now think about, too, just give you another chapter of your book. Think about all the things you don't know about people. <laughs> Think about all the expectations other people. If you knew like what other people's unexpressed expectations were of you, you'd be like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> That's insane. That's crazy. I'm sorry. What? Like you're mad at me for what? I had no idea. Like we have to give people I, I don't know. I'm still learning this over and over and over. Like we have to give people the, the tools to like, to treat us right and love us. Like they're not, we're, they're not, they're not sort of born with like a, you know, a skeleton key that unlocks every single, you know, person's psyche. This feels obvious. Right. As we're saying this, right. people are probably listening to this nodding like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this. I know this. But in reality. Oh, in reality, it is. You're like, um, I'm sorry. My boyfriend tried to spend a weekend alone. <laughs> like, <laughs> He's breaking up with me. He's breaking up with me. And in fact, I can think of a time in my 20s where this boyfriend went on, you know, several trips and 
it was to like visit his college friends. And so he went with his college friends. And Sean, if you can believe it, one of the college friends he was visiting was a girl. No, no, no. Can't yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, she was very pretty and she had big boobs. Why did I know that? Because I Googled her. Okay. Because I, I spent an entire weekend being like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> There's another woman there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I guess now we're just like being around other people, are we? Other like, of the people of the gender that we may be attracted to. Wow. Okay. I guess. In a platonic capacity. Right. As if, meanwhile, my best friend in the world, a, a boy I met in college, should anyone question that, I would have lost my mind. You're having sleepovers watching Clueless Wh right. with this man. But he's just a friend. He is just a friend. And how dare you <laughs> dare you try to do the same? Okay. <laughs> so it's so bananas. But in the moment, I could probably get on on Gmail right now and find all the G chats from that era when I was like, I just don't know what to do. And my friends were like, yeah, he's a dirtbag. <laughs> <I G> just... <laughs> the G chats. Sometimes every now and then I'll be searching something in Gmail and then the old G chats oh. come up. Oh. And there is a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot, There's a a lot, lot of dysfunction, dysfunction. There's on, a my, lot of dysfunction. on my behalf. Oh, same, same. And I, I really do. I think I can look back at most of my, you know, of my relationships and be like, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. That was me. A lot of that was me. <laughs> that was my bad. Can we agree that relationships are work? Yes. Oh, my God. All love is work. Like loving people are like, oh, my God, you just love your kids. <sighs> you do. And also like that love is work. It is absolutely work. Love is so unglamorous. True, real love is the least, least glamorous thing. TV love. Yeah. TV oh. love is glamorous. We love it. My dad was like, do you want love or do you want romance? I'll take love. Mm hmm. I'll take and love I with like, a little bit of romance. With a little bit of romance. And my and dad a lot was of like, patience. And a lot of patience. A lot of patience. And, you know, my parents' marriage was not perfect. And also, my dad really did show me what commitment and devotion meant. And I am very, very grateful for that. He and my mom were not mirror images of each other at all. And he did make fun of her. You know, like he just, his love language was like j different. Jokes. J jokes. <laughs> jokes at the expense of yes. his wife. <laughs> yes. And, and also he just had such admiration for all the things that she was that he wasn't. Mm. You know, like I, that's, that's a very important key. It is. I'm looking at this invitation on my wall to their 35th wedding anniversary, which is, I got invited. I'd just broken up with this boyfriend. I I was, you know, going to my parents' 35th wedding anniversary and my dad wrote it and it says, um, July 2nd, 1949, Margaret Nagin is born. July 6th, 1974, she marries Stephen McInerney. 2009, Margaret turns 60 and celebrates or at least acknowledges her 35th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Please join us in celebrating the confluence of two events as rare as hen's teeth, a woman not afraid to go gray and age gracefully. And, oh God, what is that? A plighted trough that's weathering the vicissitudes of the times. <laughs> wow. And then uh, in very, very small font, hold on, I can't read it because it's so small. It's like 0.5 font. The quiet older gentleman you will see hovering the outer edges of the event is Margaret's husband. <laughs> oh. Like he just, he hated parties, hated parties. And that is how they celebrated with a party. Yeah, and, he did it. He did it anyways. Yeah. And he and he wrote that invitation to say, like, you know, it's her birthday and this is our wedding anniversary. And I will be there on the very edges sitting yeah. quietly because I cannot stand loud, loud noises um, and 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 sitting in whatever chair only has one companion to it because I do not like um, large groups. <laughs> So that to me looks like compromise. It looks like accepting someone's differences. It looks like not feeling threatened yeah, by somebody wanting something different, like your mom loving parties and him not. Like someone could really feel threatened about somebody that. Somebody could, yeah. Somebody could. And 
you know, I'm sure they had moments like that. You're not really sort of privy to like the truth of, of your parents' marriage as much as you, you know, uh, I mean, I would say like pe- once you move out, like you, you definitely get like a front seat when you're a kid, which is another thing to remind yourself. So. Wait, what uh, are we reminding ourselves? How- oh, that like your kids see the truth of your marriage when they live with you, when they're little, like we <laughs> see it, like whether or not like whether or not you think they are paying attention like they are they are clocking every interaction they are little sponges absorbing all of this you know every every little like shift in energy um and you know i know that i know that just from from watching my own kids and having them be like hey is everything okay dad seems really quiet i'm like huh wow yeah he does doesn't he <laughs> like Th- this might This might seem a little dark, but I'm going to go there. Um, It's not that dark, but I get questions from people saying, um, should I stay in the relationship that isn't good for me for the kids? And my belief is that if you stay in a relationship that's not good for the kids, they will see one of their parents abandoning themselves Yeah, to preserve something that might actually not be that great. And that will leave an imprint on those Mm -hmm. kids, especially if it's a daughter seeing her mom abandon herself, what she really wants, what she really needs. And also like, you know, big fat grain of salt. I'm not a parent. I'm also not a woman. Yeah. Um, I, but I mean, kids always know kids always know. And I had several friends who, you know, as, as, like very young adults, like 19 or 20, have these huge realizations about the truth of their parents' marriage and and the guilt that they felt knowing that, oh, my parents stayed together for me. Totally. But guess what? It wasn't that great for me. I knew something was off. I knew our home was unhappy. I knew my parents were not okay. And what it I what I think that it teaches a kid too is like how to mask your own emotions it it teaches them that their their unhappiness is unacceptable and you don't want that like if if it is not something that you would want for your children to do Mm. i don't think that you should subject yourself to it either Ooh, that's a good litmus test you know it's like do you and and i'm also like i was i was married to i am married am married to a person who did that and and what i can say from you know those the the older kids in our family is like they knew they knew the whole time they knew kids know everything but parents are pretty oblivious so we're the dumbest the like, dumbest the dumbest kind of person <laughs> i did so many drugs when i was younger and like i'm just like how did they not know is really the biggest mystery that i have uh, my parents were like oh my god your brother and his friends are watching charlie and the chocolate factory again i'm like oh yeah i wonder why they're like oh, such nerds like get a girlfriend i'm like oh. <laughs> they're That's- doing something better than girlfriends <laughs> right i'm like yeah they're they're on they're on another planet right now margaret i don't think they're worried about girls okay like occasionally more than occasionally but like periodically i would say that i'm like absolutely stunned by just uh, th- like the privilege of like of shaping a person and then terrified of it in the same breath like our our ch- children will ask us these huge questions i'm like oh um oh this is the moment this is a this is a parenting moment um okay uh what does happen google, when we die google uh, yeah <laughs> Like, uh, great, 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 great. Well, um, does it hurt when you die? Ah, some people, yeah, pretty bad. No, that's not what I. Like, it's just <laughs> it depends how you whoo, die. Yeah, yeah. Or like you know, our fourteen year old being like, "Well, did you guys ever do drugs?" I'm like, "Well, hard, yes, and yes, we. Well, okay. I got a picture of your dad doing a pretty sick bong rip, but I. <laughs> I I'm not going to tell you everything. Yeah, I I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to tell. You know what? It's. He was older. He was 17. So what you'd need to know is... You need to wait. <laughs> wait till you're 17. It's all... All of it is so arbitrary. It's so... <laughs> it's like, it makes you re-examine all the... Like, I have to ask myself, is this actually important to me? Or is this just how I was raised? 
Mm. Like, why am I saying no to this? Like, is it actually important or am I just repeating something? And and I think that's I mean, maybe that's the question yeah. for all of us, for everything. Like, is this actually important or do I just think it's important? <sighs> oh, man. Man, I oh, think, man. OK, that's. We're going to end on that, but... We're going to end on that. Okay. We're, we're ending on that because we can... I I have ADD. Say ADHD, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I was diagnosed by by a, um, a friend, a potential podcast guest. Wow. On an intro call that lasted <laughs> two hours. It's supposed to be a 15-minute call. It lasted two hours. And then at the end, she goes, oh, I think you might have ADHD. I go, oh, okay. Does that explain why we just spent two hours talking? Yeah, might, might be. <laughs> it might. Might um, be. What was the last point? Yeah, I don't remember. But I do know that I was 36 minutes late to this because in my mind, it was at three. It was on my calendar at the correct time. But I was also like, just in, I had already believed that. That's another thing. There's no object permanence. There's no like time permanence. Like I'm just like, Oh, I've just decided that's at three o'clock, not two o'clock. Why would I have to double check it? Uh, it was I'll, a time thing. It's a time thing. I just and I was I was like looking forward to it at a different time. Like I got your email and it was like, we missed each other. I was like, no, we didn't. It's <laughs> you fucked up, Sean. And then I was like, oh, did you also get my text? No. Now we're connected. Oh, now we're connected. There we go. Good, good, good. No, I turned off notifications on my computer because I was just in the flow. I was just zooming through stuff. What I wrote was, Nora, Sean here, are you still available to record our episode or would you like to reschedule? And then it, in parentheses, it's now, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, well, you did. That's exactly it. Okay, we're going to add that to contacts. So people, that's what... Um, that's how you do it. That's how you talk to a celebrity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how, how you, you do it. That's how you do it. That's how you talk to a... Uh, that's how you talk to a... Uh, a like a really like a G-list uh, celebrity, but still, okay? You think G? Yeah, I think... Yeah, Ooh, I think so. Yeah. I think you're higher yeah. than G. Yeah, I... Uh, debatable, debatable. My my son said... um, I... Uh, <laughs> said, you know how I know you're not a celebrity? And I said, how? And he goes, our house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Could just be like a, um, like a down-to-earth, <laughs> way down-to-earth celebrity. <gasps> Isn't that amazing? I yeah. was like, <laughs> I was like, thank you, buddy. Wait, thank is this you. your seven-year-old? Yep. With the yep, podcast? Yep, yep. yep. With yep. the highly ranking, quite possibly higher than my podcast in Canada. I, I, his podcast is doing really well. It's doing really well. Ralph's podcast. That's what it's called. Ralph's podcast. We're going to link to it. It's not available there. everywhere because I don't know how to get it everywhere. Okay. And, but I know it's on Spotify and Apple. And that's he, all that really matters. Those are the big ones. And he's just such a riot. And uh, you should probably talk to him because he knows quite a lot. He knows about quite foods about foods. He is, the podcast is in no way about foods. He kept trying to call it foods. I was like, you don't even eat food, dude. We're not calling it foods. Chicken nuggets. It's chicken nuggets only. Okay. Okay. Nora, uh, Sean, right. thank you Nora, so yes. much. Wait, but thank first, you. we where, were saying goodbye. Yes. Where, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Nora Borealis and at Nora Borealis.com. You have a book, you have a book club. I You've a, got a, a hot yeah. young widows club. Yeah, if, you are, if you have lost your romantic partner, you can join us at the hot young widows club. I have a podcast called Terrible Things for Asking. Uh, it's uh, going to make you cry. Also, there's a cry. sort of an Illuminati thing going there's on. There's an Illuminati. I was accused of being in the Illuminati recently. I do think that that does mean I have made it. Um, and uh, still kicking, still kicking. <laughs> Jeez, Louise, I'm so bad at this. Uh, yeah, you have a lot of stuff though. We have a lot of stuff going on. We have a yeah. I have a company called Still Kicking. No G. Dot co. Still Kicking. Dot co. Go check that out. Cool T-shirts cool helping, helping people. Helping people. Uh, just, yeah, I'm the worst. I'm the worst salesperson in the world, but, but there we are. But, but mainly just go to Instagram yeah. and then, yes. and then click the link you'll in the find bio. Yourself. You'll find your way. You'll find your way. <laughs> okay. One last question. Yes. Um, what does love mean to you? Oh God. Um, oh, I honestly, I do think that love is the work that we do every day to show people that they're important to us. 
And that looks different for every relationship and it looks different every day. Um, and it looks different in, in context, right? Like love in, in a big societal context is like how we, ca- how, what is the work that we are doing to make sure everybody on this earth is taken care of? Like, what is the work that we are doing in our communities? What is the work that we are doing in our homes, in our families? How do we truly show the people we love that they matter and that we care about them? Wow, that is a lot more than, does he love me? Yeah. <laughs> It's more than that. It's more than that. And I'm, you know, we all have different love languages and it is, uh, I'm sure that there are more than just the five in the book, but uh, that, that work will always, it looks a lot different for my husband than it does for my colleagues and my friends. And it looks a lot different for, you know, my 19 year old than it does for my four year old. And I, I don't know. That's why love is work. I fully agree. Like love is work. And, and if, that's what makes it valuable. The things that we don't have to, you know, that's what makes it valuable. I'll end there. Mic drop. Like, and... Mic drop. <laughs> John, I actually can't afford to drop it. I would never do that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. I'm super, super pumped that we now have each other's telephone number. I know. I know. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Get ready. Uh, get ready I'm going to use some, it. For some text messages. Me too. Me too. Thanks, Sean. Thank you for spending this hour with Nora and myself today. Have a beautiful week.